Preparing to delve in three, two, one. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Delve. My name is Nathan, and uh, today uh, Alex has abandoned me. But good news, uh, I am not alone, and uh, so I'm very happy to welcome back to the show Pat McNary from Orcs Unlimited. Pat, thank you for coming on. Yeah. Yeah, it's always fun to be here. Uh, And I actually brought you on uh, because I had a specific subject that I wanted to discuss. And uh, luckily, it's one that Alex was like, "Ah, I can't help you with this one, Nathan. I wanted to talk uh, a little bit about the the idea of a a game's setting uh, informing the mechanics uh, of that game. And so when I think about like the games that you've made, like when we talk about you know Space Pirates the Musical or We Hunt Bugs or uh, Escape to Teddy Bear Island, these are very definitive you know settings that you've made. And I figured that if anyone knows how to work mechanics in in those settings, uh, it would probably be you. I have some ideas on how to do it. Okay, so I guess I'll take Teddy Bear Island as an example. When you originally developed uh, that game. I, I imagine the setting came before you you worked out all the ins and outs of of how the game functioned, right? Yes, um, it was kind of a let's make fun of D and D setting. So. Oh, okay, <laughs> was that was that the general idea behind Teddy Bear Island? A long time ago, we were having a conversation while playing D and D. It was like you're going to go to the evil wizard's keep or something. They're like, yeah, that's no big deal. Everybody goes to like you know. Everybody was got to go to the Temple of Elemental Evil or the Evil Wizard's Keep. What you got to be scared of is if you're going to Teddy Bear Island. Mm-hmm. And so it's like it just kind of went from there. That was kind of like, oh, I see. What we're we gonna do here? So from that, you end up getting a whole setting. It's like, no, I'm gonna show you. We're actually gonna make Teddy Bear Island. <laughs> you're gonna love it. Yeah, we're gonna go to Teddy Bear Island, suckers. You enjoy. So the setting came first. When you did the initial stages of that, did you flesh out that world before you really started looking at at the mechanics of it? What we do a lot when we do our games is we we come up with our initial idea, and then we um, build like a basic world. So we came up with the idea that there were going to be man eating stuffed teddy bears, and and that we were going to do it in a fantasy setting. Um, and then the world always kind of evolves through test play, but we had a good we well nailed down the world before we started with mechanics. We were probably about 70% of the world before we started on the mechanics, and then the rest of it developed through test play. The storyline, essentially, like the, the fleshing out of that, sort of worked in tandem a little bit with it? A little bit. We had, like, um, a lot of the people and places uh, arrived during test play, but the basic world... We knew where we were going when we started test play and started our mechanic building, but mm. yeah, we wanted um, a lot of times NPCs or NPCs or player characters from our test play end up being major components of the world when we're done with it, and the the places that are visited and the the people that are seen help us evolve our world as we go forward. But usually, we we're about seventy percent when we start mechanic. So. When you uh, when you get around to the actual mechanics of the game, how do you form those so that they make sense inside of the world that you've now built? Well, with many of our games, we have a a, a similar base mechanic, or, or you know, or what dice you roll and, and how you gain that success. But like how we do magic or cyberware or something is kind of decided early in mechanics. So we want to make sure that like like most other, when we did uh, bugs, we have a, a cyberware component to the game. We looked at, do we want to do something like uh, like Shadowrun or Cyberpunk 2020 or many of the other games before mm. have with, with balancing out how much cyberware you can have and why and all that stuff. Um, we initially, just, we, eventually we decided against it. We said, if you have the money, you can buy the cyberware. We don't really care. But, um, <laughs> right. but we, we, that was a, it was a good long discussion during development was what we were going to do about that. Escape from Teddy Bear Island, we decided that magic operates as if it were a special skill. So the same as if somebody was to do an acrobatic maneuver, 
it was just something that, that you learned how to do as opposed to something that you were gifted at birth or something. Okay. So that kind of, kind of developed the, where we are going with the world. So everybody is capable of doing magic. So that kind of changed up the world a little bit as we decided that too. So while there are characters that are definite magic users, everybody can do it. They're just trained to do it. So they do it better than everybody else does. So that's, that's actually like a, a larger like world building kind of thing. It feels like, you know, like that, that informs like everything else after that, when you start to realize that magic has to be delineated out to everyone instead of a select group. And we found that when we make these, mechanic decisions sometimes it does change our overview of the world again in bugs when we decide that you just whatever how much cyberware you could have you could buy you had so it just kind of became a everybody has all this ridiculous stuff and, right and it's just so you, you don't even go into a clinic you just slap it on and it takes over so you don't have to like no medical game, game play you don't have to worry about going to find a clinic you order it from uh, the amazon uh, it comes and you just slap it on your arm and it just replaces your original arm type of thing. Uh, oh, that's cool. That's and so <laughs> that's a full service Amazon right there. Right. <laughs> uh, and then when we decided that portion of mechanics, it did it added this this goofy like Amazon drone shows up with new guns and bullets and a arm for Bob who just got eaten by a bug. It kind right. of added a, a fun world element too. So it kind of goes back and forth. We get a basic idea of the world, but sometimes the mechanics change the world as we go forward. In a world where, you know, you have a mass uh, a company that can just, like, drone in equipment, that's got to change the way you think of of play. I don't have to go to a shop anymore. <laughs> I can just open yeah. up an app. Well, yeah, you just have, a, yeah, you just, so, like, in the game, uh, you we decided that you just have instant access to it. You have, like, a neural access to it. You're like, hey, I need a new gun. Poof, and it shows up. Right. And, and uh, eventually that came into, um, so the game is super deadly, you die a lot. And, mm. and similar to other games have kind of done the same is, so Amazon just, re- just delivers a new Bob once Bob's dead. So your phone oh. shows up, like, there you go, and then just deduct it from your account. Like, oh, oh. Bob's dead. Oh. Drone bops a new Bob off. Keep going. <laughs> <laughs> okay so oh okay so that kind of reminds me of like in um to think of like a bioshock or a uh or like a borderlands where like uh oh no i got killed and then uh you get like you you respawn back at the point and they're like yep this cost you this much money you enjoy it kind of and it adds again to the world because uh in a world where if you die your new clone just shows up life is super cheap uh, so it kind of changes the vision of the the whole world as we went forward too. And then nobody, right. you, you die. Oh well, fifteen hundred <laughs> bucks for a new clone. Get moving. So uh, in that case, do you only like truly die when you run out of money? Pretty much. That's right. so. It's all about keeping that bank account full so you can right stay alive. Yeah. Does it? Uh, do you end up? spending more money as uh as you get higher levels like if like if i'm a level five is it more expensive to drop in a new level five bob than it is level one bob uh, it really comes out to uh you want to try to stay alive because as you level up your dr- your clone comes back is however you left base oh so if you okay. level up while you're in the field your clone starts at the basic so oh, okay so it's okay. not really a level but if you get more, if you advance, your character gets advancements while you're out in the field, and then you just drop Bob. And then Bob's just a basic Bob, so you got to buy all that cyberware over again, and you need new guns. So you oh, got gotta to lock that in. You got to, yeah, and you got to hope, hope that there was either something left after the bug ate you, or that your your uh, teammates didn't loot Bob before your new clone shows up. Oh, yeah, that would also uh, suck. So, <laughs> so okay. You know, it feels like uh, it feels kind of like in in Dark Souls, actually. In that regard, it's like, well, I, I collected like eighteen hundred souls, but then I died, and they're out in the field somewhere, and I got to go find my damn body so I can get my souls back because I didn't upgrade. I should have upgraded back when I was at base. So damn, I, could have I should have saved my clone. Yeah, I really should have done that. Okay, so in a system where the idea of life and death has become 
uh, almost like a, a factory sort of output, uh, you have to then meld a lot of mechanics around that that make sense. Yeah, so th- sometimes it's the mechanics that do it, and sometimes we have to form a specific mechanic to do it. Okay. So kind of back in, you get your basic world design, and then we, we change it a lot, and it evolves a lot through mechanics and test play that way. In, the, in that case, so you were saying it's about 70% your game is pretty much like 70% done in terms of world building before the mechanics really come into play. And that's about what we look at. We okay. want a really good grasp of what the characters are going to be doing and what the world around them looks like and, and uh, how the base economy works and what, you know, we don't do microeconomics or anything, but just kind of like, well, what's the money system where the money's from in teddy bear Island. It's the eyes of the teddy bears become the money. And then that adds not only world building, but then when you go into how much does gear cost, it's like, well, how many teddy bears, how many monsters do you have to kill to be able to buy a new sword? Oh, okay. So about 70% done, uh, and then that last 30% for world building is sort of integrated with the mechanics that you're building for it. Yeah, so we usually kind of, like, as we go forward through mechanics, and you're like, oh, okay, I see this is going to have to change something in the world, or... Um, that mechanic doesn't work because the way we wanted the world to work works this way, so we'll tweak the mechanic. So, so, like, and then in test play, obviously, we're like, well, that didn't work the way we meant it to. Let's go back and do that over. It's not uh, the way I guess I'm thinking about it is like I, I am 70% done, and then there's a 30% gray area. It's more like the, the world is done, but you just need to flesh it out. Like you have, you have your framework for the entire thing, but in order to get the tweaks to, to the world a little bit better – you you have to start d- digging into the actual gameplay of it. Usually, like we have to like we want to come up with how players live, where they live, what they do, what the rest of the world does, what service they provide inside that world. Um, they provide and, nothing. <laughs> not, they don't that do anything. Sometimes with, that's what we want to move forward with, and sometimes that that works out. Um, right. But there's always the the key. My very first step is, what do I want people to do? Like, okay, like uh, sometimes you get too much of a sandbox, and then there's too much openness. It's like these characters. Uh, let's take Shadowrun for example. Uh, sure, you know what they do from the very beginning. Your, your mm-hmm. characters are they're Shadowrunners. There's no right. like, and then few people change it up throughout the game. But 99 percent of the time, when you play Shadowrun, you're going to be Shadowrunners. You're going to be criminals. You're going to do this. Right. Um, and, and love it or, or not, you know where you're going forward. The players know where they're going. If you're playing Star Wars, 90% of the time you're going to play the Rebel Alliance and you're going to fight the, the Empire. So you know where you're starting. Sometimes games don't have that, don't have like a, a drive. Mm-hmm. We, like, especially because we, we do a lot of games that are pickup games. Like, mm-hmm. before you pick up this game, we want to know where you're going. You straight drive. And so that's usually our first step. Uh, world you. building and then we mm-hmm. go into well we like to get even down to like the, a basic your basic economy uh what the food is like and that kind of stuff what what's entertainment look like um and then as we go forward we're like oh they like sports what kind of sports what do they do um or racing mm-hmm. okay, let's let's add a racing thing here and there and so we'll like we'll do an adventure where the characters are playing this sport or doing this race or whatever and so it gives us the ability to really look at it and then mm-hmm. flesh it out a little bit as we go forward with it. When you get down to it and you start to realize all of these things that are happening around it, like they like to like watch racing, do you realize, oh no, I have to create like a whole pod racing scenario for this game? Sometimes that's the way it works okay. out. Sometimes, like if you're doing a game that's pretty close on modern, like you're looking at like it's 2020 and only this thing has changed. It makes the game worth, you know, your catch. Right. Being like, oh yeah, they watch NASCAR. Oh, okay. You don't have to play much of yeah. that. <laughs> you get, that's flavor text. It's, yeah. it's fine. We don't you have do to... a far future world that takes place out in, you know, on some distant planet. And sometimes you, then we have to do really look at, well, you know, is it, what, what does this game look like? Let's come up with the rules for the game and the mechanics for the game. And is the game in high gravity or low gravity of the players? So we'll come up with mechanics for the game sometimes as well. Mm-hmm. But sometimes if it's like, well... You know, it, it's 
it's Earth in 2020 with this slight with with uh, vampires. Okay, well, I can figure what 2020 America looks like because uh, exactly. I live it. So you have, <laughs> right. So you don't really have to play too much there, but um, yeah. the more fantastic the world is, the more we have to go back and be like, okay, well, this is how the game works. Here's how it's televised. Even there's a big game that everybody loves. It's like foot football, the American football of this world. And it's like, Quidditch. Yeah, <laughs> kind of it's very it's the quidditch it's closer to quidditch football so we came up with the rules and we did all of that and then we're like okay well how do people see it mm. so we had hmm. to come up with a, a television network basically type of mm. thing so uh because so, like oh well that didn't work out exactly what we meant to so we had to come <laughs> up with a rule and a mechanic for how that worked and then ended up changing a couple other things in the game as we went forward and see but um usually we get when we get to test play, we're looking at about ninety percent of the mechanics done and about seventy eighty percent of the world done. Mm-hmm. Uh, but test play does change that a lot. I so, see. and we, we've gone to test play and thrown the entire game out, kept the world, <laughs> rebuilt new mechanics. So I see. Sometimes <laughs> it just like yeah, that sucks. <laughs> yeah yeah i get that um that's gotta be a fun thing I mean, yeah well we worked pretty hard on it but uh all right let's scrap it <laughs> um, that didn't work. yeah that didn't work um so how do you determine like when something like one of those factors like the 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 racing games or the sports games or anything like that when do you determine that like maybe this should be more than just like a, a world building or flavor text or something that, you know, just tries to flesh it out. When do you realize, oh, you know what? Maybe we actually need to have something mechanically inside of that. Something a little bit more uh, substantial. So usually, again, that you that usually ends up in test play. Uh, mm. Because if the characters are interested in it in text play, then we go back and look and see if it needs, if I need rules, if I need a mechanic for it if you need so it would be like in test play people are like yeah let's go play this or we want to watch this and how does it work and we're like oh yeah i hadn't got that far yet so um mm. and sometimes it works really close to you know it just uh, it just so it's racing it's combat racing and we already have uh vehicle combat rules there you, that's how it works here's how it's scored um, oh, okay sometimes it's a little bit more involved in that a lot of test play when you actually get down to to throwing it in people's hands. Uh, is is some of that like just uh, where people are like, you know, we came here to you know kill uh, the teddy bears or the bugs, and it's going to take a lot uh, of time to to work on like actually navigating some of the other parts of it. Is it about flow when you get down to a lot Sometimes. of the, some? Okay. Uh, so, so we try. Um, I want to keep the world sandbox enough to play, mm-hmm. but because we we kind of specialize in these strange off games that are usually pickup games, not a lot of campaign. Uh, right. We really just try to to keep it streamlined. But sometimes um, some of our larger games have, have kind of comes down to the larger game too. What your vision of the game is. Space Pirates the musical has very little. It's here, your space pirates have fun, sing, yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> Because it doesn't, it, 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 the vision of the game is that uh, Bob couldn't make the D and D game today. I got this new Space Pirates game. You want to screw off for a couple hours? <laughs> uh, right. So we didn't uh, build a great big world because you're not really going to explore it much. We don't figure. And if you okay. want to, it's it's a very pulpish game. You just make up the world as you go. Okay. But when we get to um, we get to Ink, which is our new big game that will be coming out this year um this will be our largest game it mm. we've gone through and we've made the world we filled in a lot of the world we have a, more than a dozen races we have this big game we have huge cities um a big continent to explore and so we've had to fill it in with what we want to be there we needed mechanics for drilling and we needed mechanics oh. for how food it's not necessarily a mechanic, but you need a reason and a and a physical thing for how you would feed these people in giant floating cities and, and things like that. Okay. And some of that mechanic and world building came out as we fleshed and fleshed and fleshed. But in some of the smaller games, it's just like, here's your direction, go with mm-hmm. it. When we're talking about ink, for instance, 
Uh, once you figure out like a system where people have to get, you know, food and all of those things, do you then have to create a mechanic where like I'm going to get hungry at certain points or do you just kind of uh, like go, eh, nah, it's just, this is just a very basic, uh, uh, you need food. And, and if you don't get food, eventually this is what's going to happen. But okay. We didn't do a, you have to go to the bathroom this many times a day. Uh, oh, okay. An old, uh, the old ICE type mechanics or, or the right. original travelers where, where it was like, mm-hmm. oh, roll the hundred on this and see what you ate or if you have a digestion or. Okay. Um, yeah. And while I poke fun at those games, I love them. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, no, it, it reminds me of like uh, when Fallout was like, here's their hardcore mode. And what it ba- basically what happens at that point is like, yeah, here's your, here's your hunger meter, your sleep meter, your, your, yeah. your, your, your thirst meter. <laughs> <laughs> and that kind of gets in the way of storytelling, and in the yeah. end, that's kind of where you want to go with most tabletop role-playing games, is the storytelling, and so it's like, I do like, all right, so uh, your character needs to go to the bathroom. I, did, I kind of throw that in when I'm GMing, like, mm. now and then, because that way when I say something ridiculous, like, hey, your character's in the kitchen eating, the characters don't go, oh no, what's going to happen in the kitchen? Okay. Like, oh, okay. Like, hey, your character guys go to the bathroom. Okay, go to the bathroom. And then so the tenth time I say, "Hey, your character has to go to the bathroom." I was like, "Oh, I go to the bathroom." All right, there's a bomb on the toilet. Um, <laughs> they automatically assume I have to go to the bathroom. There must be a bomb on the toilet or a gelatinous tube in the bathtub or something. Right? Surprise! <laughs> you look at what's it's there now. We kind of get to that point in in role playing games. It's completely off topic, but uh, my soapbox for a Fine. second. It gets to this point yeah. where if you if a GM mentions something mundane the players instantly know that it's not something mundane. So as a game master, and I'm using the developer, I like to throw out these mundane things so that they're not like, uh, they're not they're like, oh, yeah, there's this, the, the, the door is gold. And people are like, oh, why is right. the door gold? There's a trap on it, or obviously. But if yeah. every now and then, if you, every fifth door, you oh, the door is red with a big window in it. Like, oh, okay. And that way, the 10th time, you say, hey, the door is gold. They go, oh, okay. And then they open the door and everybody dies. It's hilarious. But um, <laughs> Yeah, no, so many people have told me that. It's like, yeah, you got to be careful because, you know, you, you put too many details into a, a random thing that's happening and people are instantly, your players will instantly think that that is a clue, that there is, that there is something going on with that. And I think it's kind of interesting because, like, in games from Orcs Unlimited, we're talking about worlds that have, like, homicidal teddy bears and, and ink monsters and, <laughs> and giant kaiju. The kaiju is destroying the city. By the way, the door is gold. Ooh, what's up with this door? <laughs> it's like, no, what's don't up worry. The door. What's up with the door? No, 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 don't worry about the door. The door is not important. You have bigger fish to fry right now. Literally, there's a giant fish monster outside. You got to deal with gotta that. Take care of that. We try to do over the top. We seem to do it well. I imagine this happens a lot when you you get into playtesting, where you realize that some of the mechanics are actually getting in the way of the um of the the game play it's breaking up the flow uh, we find that we try to like try to work it out in test in mechanic de- development but it doesn't always work but like be like okay well make a roll let me consult this chart which you don't have a lot of but anytime it's more than intuitive or right, you make the roll it was successful let's go go forward we start to we start to look at things and be like eh that needed if it takes you out of a conversation for more than a probably 30 seconds we kind of go back and, and look at if it's needed does it add the flavor that we want to the game uh does it break the, the does it break up the the forward motion too much uh, i see so usually we're looking at anything that's more than one table check and one roll is too much okay um, yeah. and we try to even get out the, get out of the table check like if it's not written on your character sheet, you probably don't need to need that piece of information. I see. Um, but because we're really looking at, we really try to work with the fast moving. We want the game to be more narrative than combat, or more narrative than dice rolling, mm-hmm. than table checking. But on the alternate side, you want enough rules to have a, a a frame that everybody's playing in the same stadium. So we kind of, that's always the mix. And then there's all, there is times where you go, that rule sucked. We need it. <laughs> right. 
throw it out and it'll just you know scratch it out of the book as we go down the go down test play Mm -hmm. Uh, sometimes we found that we end up putting them in like an optional section because we'll have one test group that like oh this was perfect and we really needed this rule and it helped us keep everything consistent when we Mm -hmm. thought we did our initial test play yeah that rule sucked (laughs) no use for it Uh, and so it's it's the, one of the reasons why you try to have four or five different groups test play your game. So when you get back that feedback, you're like, oh, maybe <laughs> I don't need to do that rule entirely. Maybe I'll just put it in an optional section so people that they're looking for something uh, uh, more with more framework have an option for more framework. I see. Okay. Uh, yeah. So because I'm always I'm always thinking to myself like. Something that I don't think usually is considered like a, a mechanical like design part, but it feels like it's more and more relevant as you get like into the into the playtesting phase is about uh, uh, pacing. Like pacing is definitely a thing that you start looking at later on down the road when you yeah. start like implementing. We found that pacing is probably 30 percent rules, 70 percent group. Uh, but it definitely okay. has some rules to it. Some games move so quickly they might as well just be a storytelling, which is, if it's your thing, congratulations, right. enjoy it. <laughs> um, and then mm-hmm. some games, like Rifts, a game I love, but definitely has it, it definitely heavy rules component, and the rules tend to blow up the game sometimes in the, in the, the discussion of the game. Um, yeah. We try to be somewhere in between, but it kind of also depends on your vision and what you're looking for. But it, uh, on the other, other hand, it comes down to what the players and, and the game master want when they're looking for their pacing too. But you might have set up a, um, in development, we set up a structure that gives like, a, you set up your structure and then they can either take or add from and make it faster or slower as the individual group feels. Mm. And so we found that we, what we end up finding, finding is they're adding some optional uh, stuff in. We usually play our games outside of test play. Like when we play Teddy Bear Island for fun, we don't do the tactical combat. Okay. But it, it's sometimes such an important portion for so many groups. It's such an important person portion of the game. Mm-hmm. We make sure it went into the game. Uh, okay. Many okay. players want to see where their guy moves on a little board and want to see the, the miniatures of the dead bodies lying on the ground. Is they <laughs> clear, That's what they want. That's how they play a game. That's, that's how role-playing works for them. Right. And we want to make sure that was an option for those players. We I don't see. usually use it. We usually just move through and keep going. But right. Right. a lot of players do. So it yeah. was important to us when we developed the game that it had that possibility. From my limited experience, sometimes like tactical can be a uh, uh, fun, like you know, just because you know, I, I, oh, actually my stats are finally relevant now. I can just go in and start to smack things with with my sword. But at the same time, it does end up slowing down the overall pacing of your game. If you're playing a D and D, like every round is six seconds. <laughs> exactly. So each, each round of six seconds takes 20 minutes to play through. So. Right, yeah. And when I'm in a narrative portion, you know, it, hours can pass by in, you know, a matter of, you know, five, ten minutes. Exactly. So yeah. two weeks later, you get to the place you were going to. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's always it's always interesting, like, when the game is slower than the actual game time. Yeah. Like, when, you, when your play time is slower than the time in the game, that's when things start to feel like, oh, boy, wow, we're really, it's going to take us a long time to get through this. Yeah, we um, played two hours of a 30-second combat, and it took us two hours to get through a three-month travel. Yeah, that's a, a bit of a pacing issue, it feels yeah. like. Two, they, this 30-minute combat was just as important as three months on the road. <laughs> just Exactly. If I were to kind of like recap some of the basics here, some, some of the things that kind of become mechanically pertinent when you're talking about the world, things like uh, currency, like you were saying, like the, the economy of the system is probably going to be influenced by, uh, by the setting. Yeah. Uh, okay. The, the characters, how they start out in relative nature to the story, I guess is the way I'll put it, what they do. And and then also kind of like stuff that's inside of the world that is relevant for them. 
And then, of course, you have like uh, any game that has a magic system, you have to kind of uh, oh, right. almost hold that separate. Okay. Or if it has multiple worlds, like you have something cyberpunk or Shadowrun where you have a virtual reality world, uh, you have to really kind of set that aside separately when you're doing, uh, because they usually have a different set of rules than the mm. real, the quote unquote real world. So you have to look at, do you want to change the mechanics up to make it feel different? Or do you want to keep the game flowing or how do you deal with those separate? So those are kind of those, those separate worlds, uh, like uh, maybe astral perception, maybe uh, the matrix, maybe something of that sort, virtual reality, mm-hmm. how that affects the world and what you want mechanically to do, how it interacts with it. Those are kind mm. of big in those. Uh, usually when you think, like base Dungeons and Dragons, you're looking at kind of your economy, your magic, your magic, and then how the world, how the where the characters are in that world, and then kind of depending on you know where what, what your what your overall look of your game world is, there's some things um, that that fit into major mechanics categories too. I'll use another one of the games that that you've made that is uh, that I don't think we touched on very much, but. Uh, so, so bad day to be a kaiju. Um, when, when, when you when you have a world where there are just giant monsters around, I figure like this the the mechanics of that have got to be a little bit strange because, at, like literally, monster steps on me, I lose a thousand hit points. Like I don't know how 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 well, do you figure out the mechanics for that? So kaiju is definitely our most uh, challenging. Uh, the world. So it originally started as a very basic game where you were going to... You're, so in Kaiju, you play the monster. Okay. And, and originally, you were just going to be a monster. You're going to attack a city. That was it. Right. Um, and then a test player very early on pointed out that there wasn't a lot of role-playing to that. Mm. So uh, we went back and addressed the world, and when we, we came up with a... Well, it has to be one of our strangest ideas. <laughs> and um, so we had to go back through and and so basically the, the mechanics of the game went away. We had to rebuild the entire mechanic of the game because originally it was it was mostly a tactical combat game with like a light role playing element. Sure. And we turned it into a role playing. So in, in the game, you haven't played it. Here, here's my primer for it. You okay. play the kaiju. You work for an evil overlord. Your job secretly as the kaiju is to keep the evil overlord from winning. But you have to make sure that you don't get fired by the human resources department at the same time you're doing that. Okay. Right? <laughs> yeah. All right. Um, <laughs> we had to write a whole lot of mechanics for how human resources works. Okay. Um, yeah. Basic contract mechanic. So, like, okay. what you could skirt around in human resources how meetings and disciplinary hearings with human resources would react. Okay. So it ended up being very much the office and very little Godzilla. I just love the idea of like a Godzilla movie being a single camera comedy. <laughs> and pretty much that's what we're looking at. It, okay. it, it became a, uh, our defining moment during test play for our group was one kaiju called another kaiju something. I don't even remember what it was. And he called the human resources blimp at the same time they were trying to destroy a city. Mm. So there were four, five kaiju. So one had a one union representative was one kaiju. So there's okay. two kaiju complaining, two kaiju that were the human resource that were the union reps, mm-hmm. human resources all arguing. Well, all the humans had tanks and guns, and they're trying to kill everybody. Right. And the other kaiju is running around in a circle trying to keep the other tank, ha- trying to c- complete the mission, where the other right. four kaiju are, are arguing with human resources about whatever the first kaiju called the second kaiju. <laughs> it is definitely the, the most difficult of our games to explain to anybody, or it was the most difficult game to write, because you had to write these great, uh, mighty kaiju and how they were going to be de- destroyers of the Earth at the same time you had to make them people enough to have human resources issues and worry about getting fired from their job. So it was okay. definitely the most complicated uh, 
not just world building, but the mechanics had to be had to coincide. Mm-hmm. And then, um, how you so there's in the game there's just giant blips with human resources staff in them that follow the kaiju around. They watch the kaiju to see if they're doing their job and then give them the merits. And then like if there's an argument, the human resources blimp comes down. And, and that in and of itself was a story building and mechanical issue as we went forward. So so what should be a, a relatively straightforward game uh, mechanically ended up being having a lot of strange mechanics built into it. I uh, see. <laughs> you, you end up with mediation services for, for giant monsters. The thing that I keep thinking about is why is there not a part where like the the tanks and the planes kind of go what if we just take out the human resources blimp who will, will the monsters just give up will the monsters just go away we, we kind of just gloss over that human resources is so scary that they'd rather deal with the monsters <laughs> yeah as somebody who used to work in human resources, human resources is actually just like it's a pain in the ass to do. <laughs> I can tell, I can say that, and no one's scared of human resources in real life. It's pretty bad though. It, I, although I would say that, like, if you have a human resources department who's uh, dealing with monsters all day long, yeah, that that's got to be a pretty scary organization. If your job is to, you know, mediate giant monsters all day long, uh, I probably don't want to mess with you with my piddly yeah, they're problems. Probably not very nice people. No, and and I'm going to assume that they thought this ahead, and they're like, yeah, the blimp is invincible. We needed to make it monster proof. Because what if the yeah. monsters get out of line and decide I don't want to deal with you anymore? They've got to have like something so that they can just like. Terminate the monsters if they get out of line. That's got to yeah, be. Yeah, well, you get uh, terminated and sent back to Monster Island, and you can't leave Monster Island until you have a job. See, that does, that feels like a thing that you don't necessarily need mechanics for. You could probably just explain story wise. Like the blimp's uh, laser beam uh, hits the monster for X number of points, and they get a demerit or something. Like that. It was kind of a nightmare, and then we had to like look up. We had to like. <laughs> find all everybody's human resources guides from work and we kind of like brought them in secretly and like oh okay that's how that works yeah 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 that's what we're gonna do (laughs) (laughs) i keep like the thing that i remember from like my time in in human resources is the thing that the monsters would inevitably want to know more than anything is if they have any more personal leave time and could you calculate that for them How many points can I have? How many sick days can I have before I get pointed out? Yeah, exactly. How many times before I get an occurrence? (laughs) I need to know how many times. Know that. How many more times? Because I've got some vacation coming up. Yeah. Uh, Okay. So the discipline, it starts with a written, and then it moves to a conversation. (laughs) This is how it works. We got to write all of that into, let me tell you, writing a role-playing game human resources guide was Mm -hmm. not quite as entertaining as you might think it is. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> no kidding. <laughs> I don't know why they left it out of so many others. Right? Oh my god. That should have been in every other one. That should have been in the Star Wars RPG and D&D. And <laughs> they should have had that in World of Darkness. Imagine if you could have had a human resources department in a world yeah. with like vampires and werewolves. That would have been perfect. They could have put it into, pa- into Rifts. That would have been perfect. Exactly. Yeah. Definitely. I yeah. really needed a human resources guy to risk. That, that's what yeah. it was missing. If only they had thought this through. Well, good thing that we have a bad day to be a kaiju. In order, exactly. In order. Understand it's our most misunderstood game. <laughs> yeah, I totally understand that. Well, probably because a lot of people, when they hear that, it's like, oh my God, I got to deal with a giant monster. And then it's like, well, no, actually, you are the giant monster. Oh, okay. So I, I destroyed the city. Well, no. Here's the thing. So the human resources blimp comes down. Oh boy. Now I got it. <laughs> no. No, no, not the human resources blimp. But I think that that's interesting, kind of getting back to the point that we started with is that it feels like that was a game where you had a pretty clear like story and world concept. But then when you get into the actual mechanics of it, it almost completely changes everything about the game. <laughs> yeah. And, and that's kind of. Like, yeah, okay, here's the idea. You're a giant monster, and you got to go crush things. Except you have to watch out for human resources, and you have to actually save the day by being incompetent. 
I have to be an incompetent worker in order to keep people safe. It was kind of one of those things where we went back and watched the uh, we watched a bunch of old kaiju movies and those type of things, and and, and uh, if you will, like Voltron and some of those other. And it's like, how do these giant monsters not win? These things are how do right. they not win the day at the end of the day? Well, yeah. it has to be on purpose. There's no mm. other way you can explain Godzilla <laughs> not winning at the end of the day unless right. they do it on purpose. And so, like, oh, that's what, kind of where we went with that, and that's where it came down to HR and how why they're not doing it on purpose and, and all of that stuff. Well, it's it's sort of like when they did the modern versions of like Godzilla and and King Kong, and it starts to become like. Uh yeah, we're kind of inconsequential anyway. They they kind of helped us out in the end. They were actually being the good guys. So when we were looking for a way to make it more of a role playing game, that was where our first start was. How do they not win? How does the giant robot monster not win the day? Right. Well, he has to do it on. He has to be saving humanity from itself, and that's yeah. kind of where we came up with that role playing idea. And then the mechanics were like, oh my. <laughs> is there a quota that you have to get through of like how many humans you smush not really but they restore your hit points so you, you eat oh. a human it enjoy it restores your hit points type of thing and we refer to them as squishies in the game oh yeah that's how, that's how consequential they are to the rest of the game but at, like you were saying if you, we were looking at space pirates the musical it's uh, you know i i sing and i'm a pirate in space it's just you're a space pirate. You sing. Go watch yeah. some old space movies if you don't understand what's supposed to be going on. <laughs> so, uh, so since Ink is uh, coming out this year, did you find that there were any challenges when, like, you you got around to actually developing the mechanics in that, uh, based on this very, like, as you said, it's like the biggest and most complex of the of the games that you've made so far. Um, so, did you find any challenges with the mechanics once you had built that? Um, yeah, we found a lot of. So we it originally the game was originally built upon the same core mechanic that Escape from Teddy Bear Island, Bad Days Be a Kaiju, and even in in basic character generation we so we start with fourteen races I believe in the game, mm. and, and that just wasn't going to work. So yeah. character generation was rewritten from top to bottom, and then we found that the magic system from Teddy Bear Island didn't work anymore. It was too throw at the wall. It was too simple for us to use, mm-hmm. and, and so we had to renovate. We had to reimagine the entire magic system, and then we went to test play again, and we found out the cyberware didn't work. Um, okay. And we had to go back and redraw it, and then we came up to so the core, the ink the game is named after mm-hmm. is um, the core economy of the system, but it's also the power direct it, it's the source of all power so all what would everything that powers your vehicles your cyberware all your other stuff is also the ink and we had to come up with mechanics for how that worked and what it costs to run how many drops or ink wells or whatever it costs to run this how long and those mechanics had to come along so we started and it still runs off the same dice system that the other games run off of it's moves so far past that that like it doesn't really resemble that game anymore except okay. for the core dice system and the uh we kept the tactical combat because again we don't use a lot of tactical combat in our game mm. but we know it's, it's a thing that people like to be able to see and the tactical combat system continued to work well we found if you haven't got a chance to play the games out everybody out there it's mm. very much like a um 1980s 1990s jrpg your characters line up in rows. They attack the other rows depending on the equipment they have. For tactical combat, it works smooth. It moves fast. You still get to see it and, and have a, a little bit more visceral reaction of the physical miniature to move and that kind of stuff. People like that, but it doesn't mm. the game down as much as, as like a battle tech or mech warrior or something of that would. So yeah. we kept that system. So it's simple. It still moves fast. Um, but everything else, almost everything else, the game had to change. We we wrote it right on top of the original Teddy Bear Island, and we mm-hmm. had, yeah, it's gonna work. So we had to go keep going back to the drop over and over again. I see. It, do you think it's more important, like as a, just a general rule, that the story informs mechanics, or that mechanics inform 
the uh, the world. Generally, I'll, as from from the very beginning, if you're looking if you're looking in on your first game that you're gonna do, I would say that it's better that the mechanics conform to your world mm. than the other way around, unless. You are going to be doing something like writing a world on top of fifth edition or writing a world on top of fate or something like that, Um, which isn't a bad thing or which isn't a bad way to go. But if you want to build your own mechanics and start your own game from scratch, Mm. like all of our games are done, I I think it's better to, to rewrite your rules. And even if you're going to write on top of somebody else's system, an open system, uh, I, I think that it's more important that, because the game world is is why we're there. It's why we come. The right. mechanics are what keeps us all in the same stadium, uh, on the same television show, or whatever. However you like to like to picture it. Sure. It's what keeps us together. It's what makes our cops and robbers game uh, more adult than your five year old's cops and robbers game. Right. Right. Yeah. No. Absolutely. So, yeah. I, but I think mechanics should take I, the mechanics take a backseat to the to the world because world's what we come for. Mechanics that we're not real fans of, but the worlds that we love, we'll continue to play anyway. Mm-hmm. Uh, Rifts has a huge following, and, and I'm not trying to, even though I keep picking on it, it's just because it's a game everybody knows. Rifts has a huge following, and, and almost everybody will tell you that they would rather play it in some other game system <laughs> than the game system it's written in, but, everybody, but many people love the game. Right, uh, right. So... Uh, I'm not a fan of 5th edition, but I'll play Dungeons & Dragons because I still enjoy Dungeons & Dragons. Right, uh, right. I, I'm probably going to get plenty of heretic Twitters now. But, um, <laughs> uh, no, blasphemer, blasphemer. No, <laughs> no. Uh, Dungeons & Dragons has never been my favorite, and, and if you read my Twitter, you'll know that 1st edition, when we play Dungeons & Dragons, we play 1st edition. Um, oh, wow. Yeah, and uh, I will kill a party two or three times during an adventure. So I'm all about old school Dungeons and Dragons. <laughs> you're go you're going with like the, the old school. Are you are you still uh if if we're talking about first edition, are you d- using like the Gygaxian method of uh, rolling for stats? Like, no, you just roll and whatever you get, yeah. those are your stats. <laughs> you get your three D six and then you just you put whatever they rolled in, choose a character on top of those rolls. That's like, well, you got dexterity of twelve. You're going to be the thief. So yeah, let's go. Yeah, yeah exactly. But yeah. all my we, but we I usually build. But I wanted to be a paladin. Well, you're you suck. Sorry. So you're not a paladin. I rolled all eights. Paladin. What the hell do I do now? <laughs> I don't know. Oh, you better be a cleric, or you're a dead man. So yeah. Off topic again, but I love it. We when we do it, we like okay, roll five characters. Yeah. You might need more, but let's start with five. <laughs> <laughs> Don't get too attached to any of them. Let me get my out. <laughs> <laughs> get the craft paper out. <laughs> yeah, because, like, I'm not familiar with first edition. Like, I, I've only played in, in some of the later ones. So, uh, so in first, though, they were still kind of working off of a lot of, like, what they had with Chainmail, right? It was still a lot about yeah. tactical and wargaming. It was mostly- there was very little role playing involved in it, as we see, as we understand today. I mean, obviously, it's what developed into what we see today, but right. there was very little role playing involved in it. Like, and there was mm. races were characters. You were an elf. You weren't like an elf and wizard. You were an elf. Yeah, elf was your class. Elf was your class. <laughs> you were a dwarf, or you were so. Um, it, it, mostly, we play it for nostalgia and just because it's fun to kill off a group of characters. And we, I build the most evil traps I can think of, and. I built these gigantic dungeons and, and just these evil. And there's very little role playing involved. Every now and then you'll talk to a, a, somebody in the town or, or somebody in the dungeon. But yeah, which is why, uh, because that's how I envision Dungeons and Dragons, mm-hmm. which is my personal thing. Please don't yell at me too much Twitter or Facebook. <laughs> um, which is why I just don't get, which is why Dungeons and Dragons isn't my favorite role playing game because it's not a role playing game at that point. Right. Like, Missions are more so. I, we started. I started role playing with the Palladium role, Robotech. Oh wow! Yeah. So. Um, <laughs> <laughs> wow, there's an old thing, right? <laughs> but it is much more of a role playing game, right? Than right. as we see as we picture them today, 
And the Palladium games were more than the Dungeons & Dragons 1st Edition and 2nd Edition, which were dungeon crawls, mm-hmm. uh, which I love, and I'm not bashing. And, right. and 3rd Edition, 4th Edition, 5th Edition became more role-playing games as we see them today. They de- developed and evolved. But the original Star Wars, uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, mm-hmm. Palladium games were much more role play. They didn't have these right. big tactics elements but i prefer the role playing game always have and so when we write our games we back to the back to the topic at hand we try to keep uh uh, story first world first um and then the mechanics enough to keep you on the same page in that world right because you're Um, like, like your mechanics have to be able to support and enhance the story itself is that fair yeah yeah, that's kind of where my, they're there to keep everybody on the same page, uh, everybody to know how hurt they are, how what they can accomplish, what their character's role is, that kind of stuff. Like when I come up against some kind of a conflict, when I come into when I have some kind of event that's uh, there, I know what I what my options are, what I'm capable of doing in order to figure out how to solve this new problem that has has come my way. Exactly. Yeah. This new problem. Do am I am I the person that just bashes it with a hammer? Do I pick the lock? Do I? Right. That's kind of what your mechanics and your all that stuff's for. And but the world is why you're there. It's kind of the why and the how. And I think the why ends up being more important in the long run than the how. Sure. Yeah. From my perspective, there I'm sure there are tactical gamers that would disagree with that, but that's mm-hmm. why it's a big hobby and people play different things. I like 5th edition, uh, probably just because I'm not very familiar with most of the other editions. <laughs> I, I only had like a little bit of passing understanding of 3.5. So the, actually the one I've played the most in is is 5th. And I think it's just because it got streamlined enough where I can just focus more on the actual uh, story and what's what's happening in the world than have to worry too much about my character sheet. A lot of people that are into that, and I, it's good. It's, I think it's where not necessarily the hobby is going. So I think that that's a good addition. Uh, yeah. Personally, as a player... It's not the way I think of Dungeons and Dragons, and so that's why I haven't been as into it as many other people. I, it's also what you're introduced to. I've been playing Dungeons. I've been playing right. Dungeons and Dragons since the early days, back in yeah. the day. <laughs> <laughs> so Dungeons and Dragons. I picture this dungeon crawl and needing five characters to get through the adventure because, like, yeah, because four of them died, and it's yeah. what I love about the game world. Yeah. And so when the, we've, we've strayed very far from that, in a good way, mm-hmm. we strayed very far from that. So when I want to play Dungeons and & Dragons, it's because I want to crawl through a dungeon and kill all the characters and have evil traps that, that uh, drown a character in slime or, or whatever you want to, want to do. But that's how I envision it, and that's sure. kind of why Fifth Edition is not my favorite. Um, I definitely feel it's it's where the hobby is going. I think that narrative is definitely the big thing right now. And yeah. there's there's games that are still capitalizing and companies that are capitalizing on tactical play and, and good for them. If that's what you want to play, then play that. I don't mm-hmm. have whatever you want to play, however you play, as long as you're enjoying it and not hurting anybody else, I, I say go for it. Right. Um, right. Well, so. you, you know what happened is that uh, Wizards, uh, when they were trying to figure out 5th edition, they were like, hey, you know, I remember like uh, Teddy Bear Island and those, and maybe it should be more narrative. <laughs> <laughs> like Teddy Bear Island, I'm sure that's what they said. Yeah, that's totally what they said. <laughs> they knew that that was the conversation. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm occasionally... Sure that's what was. <laughs> yeah, so occasionally like uh, I, I, I throw the idea past Alex. Of like, hey, you know, we should like at some point maybe it would be cool if we did like a live play and we did like a live play of like uh, the original D and D or a D and D, and he was like, no, Nathan, because then I have to deal with Thacko, <laughs> and I'm like, good old Thacko. If you can calculate Thacko in your head, you were an old gamer. I always figured like Thacko is basically just it's like my AC but in reverse. The lower my kind number, of, the better. Basically. If I'm in negatives, I'm in great shape. <laughs> you just yeah. have to. 
alter your perception for a second of where you're starting the math from, but it's really the same math. It's just starting from a different direction. I think when they wrote it, they weren't expecting a lot of people to have uh, armor classes below zero. So when you start getting the negatives and that starts to throw people off because you're doing different arithmetic. And yeah, so but I'm a yeah. flat fan, obviously. Um, but that's where I started. Or not where I started, but where, where I started with Dungeons and Dragons. So I've always... Right. And you know, when we play those games, I don't really play by a lot of the chain mail rules. It's kind of like you get in this room, it looks like this. What do you do? Uh, or yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, yeah, because I always, I always thought of like the original Dungeons and Dragons as like being a lot of dungeon crawling. There's some world stuff there too, and we just, we just ignore it and play, play the yep. dungeons. That's that's the whole yeah. point, and that's yep. what you're there for. It says it right on the box. It's another yeah. one of the things when I do my naming of things i like to be pretty obvious exactly what you're doing when you open the book like oh okay uh, space pirates and we're going to be singing aha so there's my title right yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah like when i say escape from teddy bear island i wonder what i'm going to be doing in this game <laughs> probably escaping teddy bear Island. Yeah, right? <laughs> yeah. there shouldn't be a whole lot of sometimes you like look at a book and you'd be like oh that's called whatever what is it about and you open the book you're like oh that's not what i expect it to be about I, right. I don't do that. Our naming conventions are, this is what the book's about. You should know before you even open the book that you're going to shoot giant alien bugs or escape from man-eating teddy bears or sing about the zombie apocalypse. That's what yeah. you're going to be doing. Sundries and Swords is my yeah. new game. <laughs> Sundry, sundries of the Sun Dynasty. Enjoy. What the hell do I do with that? <laughs> Let's not talk what about that. What I'm doing. I can, I mean, I can think of really obscure names for almost anything. It's kind of like a thing I love to do. Like when I had pitched the idea of Rift Hunters, it's like, well, what do they do? They hunt rifts. <laughs> it's like, okay, pretty simple. I, I hate to, t I hate to tell you. Sometimes it's just that easy. Thank you for coming on and um, kind of digging into that uh, subject matter because I thought it was an interesting one that we really haven't talked in depth about on the show. For anyone who's uh, out there and might want to know more information about uh, Orcs Unlimited or the number of games that we actually discussed on the show, um, is there a place that they could go to find out more? Well, you can find us at orcsunlimited.com. Uh, we all of our games are currently available on Drive Through RPG, and uh, you can see us on Twitter at Orcs Unlimited. And, uh, and then you can go and scream about how 5th edition is better than 1st edition. You're not saying you don't like 5th edition, it's just you like the 1st edition, personally. I'm saying, play what you enjoy, enjoy mm -hmm. your people you're playing with, don't be a dick. That's what I'm saying. That's always a good lesson, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's actually a very good lesson to take away. You don't have to get all mean. Uh, if somebody it likes something different, it's fine. A lot of games out there. And they all offer different experiences. You can have whatever experience you want. And uh, if anyone out there uh, wants to find out more about Delve, you can go over to DelveCast.com and uh, click on that Patreon banner and see all of the like extended episodes with the extra mm. content. It's always good. Uh, and I want to thank our Shining Level patrons, Bonnie Ainsworth and Dominic Perry. So there's there's a lot of interesting things over there. Uh, odds and ends that might not have even been released as as content and you, of course you can find us on all sorts of podcast apps like uh apple that apple podcast thing which used to be called itunes and then they changed names on me for some real reason it's the it's the apple oh, music yeah. thing yeah i don't oh, I, right. it's not like anybody understands that brand i just i keep calling it itunes it's, it's, anyway it's not like it's been the biggest in, in the modern memory or anything. Yeah. No, we need to call it we need to call it Apple Music now. No, you really didn't. Like everybody no. assumes like when you put I in front of something, everyone's like, oh yeah, that's an Apple thing. iPod, iPhone, iTunes. It's perfectly fine. You knew what you meant, guys. We were not confused by it. Uh but anyway, you can find it over there and on uh, uh Google Play which is where you can play stuff on Google. See, that actually makes perfect sense. And you can also find mm -hmm. us on uh, Spotify is one of the new services you can find us on, which uh, I guess Spotify doesn't really inform exactly what the service is. <laughs> like if you were to hear it randomly, like, well, what, what's Spotify? You can listen to music and, and podcasts and stuff. Oh, that's how why do... I should have named it in that streamy musical thing. What are you going to name your podcast uh, li listening service? Pod listening. Podio. See, that's what, see, because it's like podcast, but audio, podio. 
that's my new All service. Right. I got to make that now. Yeah, Pat, uh, thank you for uh, stopping by. Good luck with Inc., uh, which is uh, coming out later this year. Uh, do you have an idea of uh, when it's actually going to release in full? We are in page layout now. Um, mm. Hopefully go to printing soon and final editing. So we're hoping to have copies at Gen Con is what we're looking at. Five or six people with the company are going to go to Gen Con this year. We're going to be running a bunch of games and debuting some of our card games. And hopefully, Ink will be with us when we go. So well, don't well, quote me. <laughs> <laughs> we, are, we are going to say tentatively that is the case thanks again for coming on Pat uh, and uh, discussing well actually that and many other things always fun when you guys need me you need just call I, I can call I can call digitally now I yeah. call this digi calling it's like the future on computer I always feel like, like slowly but surely Star Trek is just becoming a documentary like you're just <laughs> eventually <laughs> eventually find some Klingons though oh man yeah usually you have to go to a doctor if you get a Klingon right yeah usually they, they just kind of cut it off with a scalpel I think yeah so. it's probably for the best uh, I have a good day <laughs> <laughs> exactly I can get some of that in ba- uh, Bacta that's a different franchise but it still uh, works you know what I'm gonna go find a Bacta tank now because I think I got a Klingon while we were talking <laughs> Oh, yeah. Well, sorry I gave you my Klingon. Oh, sorry. Well, you know what? It's, it, what? What are you going to do, right? Thanks for joining us, everyone, and we'll see you on the next one. Bye. Bye.